I'm also muted. So hello, everybody. What's going on? I'm Jay Miller. Um, I want to thank everybody for coming in, checking out this awesome fireside chat that we're going to put together. I also want to just mention that this is an independent venture from everybody here. Everybody is taking time out of their day. Nobody is getting paid to be here to say the things that they're saying. Um, and we're doing this because we believe that Black folks talking to Black folks energizing other black folks to get involved in the community and take leadership roles is the most important thing. Uh, with me, we have some amazing guests. We're gonna be talking about the intersection of family, culture, community in black tech, um, how that's going to impact all of us for the present and the future. And I am going to introduce my first guest, which is the wonderful April Spite. Um, or Spate, I'm sorry, April, I always say your name wrong. I mess it up every time. Um, April is a developer, author, speaker, and educator who believes that creating for XR should be accessible for all. At Microsoft, she leads the strategic bets, focus areas in gaming, green, rust, and spatial computing within cloud advocacy. Her experience in technical training and developing curriculum spans 10 years in the nonprofit sector and now includes the onboarding of developing for XR, her focus on fundamentals, safety, and design principles, and inclusivity, and serves as the foundation of her approach uh, to educating others. She believes that learning shouldn't start with building an app or experience, rather understanding the what, why, and impact, which is the stepping stone to fostering a new generation of developers who are both mindful and strategic through the creating process. Her passion lies in the use of development of AR and VR apps and experiences for educational purposes. Her most notable achievement is her team's success in the January 2020 MIT Reality Hack. Together, they won Best in Learning, Education, and Research, as well as Best in Health and Wellness Plus Medical for their app Spellbound, a VR learning experience designed to help children with dyslexia and dysgraphia learn letter formation and word recognition. And with a prior focus on Python, her passion for educating others led to authoring two books, Bite Size Python, an introduction to Python programming, uh, which is one of my personal favorites. Um, and also my child will be learning how to code using this uh, and Visual Studio Code for Python programmers. April, thank you so much for, for joining in this. Stream. Absolutely. Thank you very much for having me. Up next, we have Cecil Phillip. Cecil is a software developer who's been around the .NET space for some time with over a decade of experience in building enterprise software. Over his career, he's worked in different roles and created software solutions for various industries such as finance, education, HR, and healthcare. And today he's a developer advocate at Stripe where he helps guide developers incorporating payment processing in their applications. He didn't put this in his bio, but also, <laughs> He's been a big mentor for me for several years, and it's one of the reasons why I decided to go into the realm of cloud advocacy, of developer um, advocacy. So, Cecil, how you doing? Doing good, man. Thank you for having me. Really appreciate it. Absolutely. Up next, one of the newest people that I've gotten to meet, and I'm so excited that I've gotten to meet her, is Shandai Person. Uh, Shade is a senior software engineer at Netflix and a TC39 delegate based in Atlanta, Georgia. She is passionate about making programming interesting and approachable for all and does that through her work as a course 
instructor at ts4js.com and a technical blogger. And you can find her on Twitter at Shandai. Shandai, how are you doing? It's muted. I'm doing great. Thank you for having me on. I'm so glad that you were able to join us. We we got to talk at Refactor Tech last year. And ever since I was like, I need to come up with an excuse to, to just extend that conversation even further. I'm glad you did. Absolutely. Up next, Paris Chandler, AKA Paris Athena. Paris is a dynamic force in the tech industry as the founder and CEO of Black Tech Pipeline, an inclusive platform offering job <laughs> opportunities, educational resources, and more for black technologists. Paris is the creator of hashtag Black Tech Twitter, which everyone should be using when you are looking for a job and posting new jobs, and also CFPs, I stand on that. Uh, a viral movement that mobilized the global community of Black Tech professionals. Beyond her role as an entrepreneur, she is a recognized speaker on tech and diversity topics, contributing to various events. Her exemplary work has earned her a spot on Entrepreneur Magazine's list of top 100 women in business in 2022 underlying her significant influence in the tech sphere. Paris, how are you doing? You're also muted. Sorry, y'all. <laughs> I said I'm good and I'm excited. I'm excited as well. This is the first time we've gotten to talk. So I'm, I'm, I'm really excited to learn more and more from you, uh, especially in, as one of, the, uh, one of the few entrepreneurs on the channel, so, or on this uh, stream. So looking forward to that. And last but certainly not least, uh, the man from Philly himself, Corey Weathers. Corey is a software developer who loves to learn and code all things .NET. As a developer advocate lead for Okta, he helps developers secure their applications <laughs> with the customer identity cloud powered by Alt0. Corey, what's going on? Oh, I'm super, super excited to be here. Though my kids are yelling in the background. So my bad if you hear them screaming. <laughs> no, that, that's okay. Corey, Corey is one of the people that I think I talk to more than anybody else. Like, <laughs> we, just, we just go back and forth. So I feel like I'm used to it. Hopefully everybody else can get used to it too. Yeah. Um, as folks can see, we have an amazing lineup of, of things happening here. And I want to make sure that we give everybody time to say all the stuff that they're doing and all the things. So if you have to plug something that you're working on that is particular to a question, feel free to do that. I think it's going to be super helpful. But again, we are here to talk about Black tech and the Black tech experience as it relates to taking that knowledge, that equity, that that wealth, that experience in general back to our families, uh, because my mom would tell me charity starts at home first, uh, to our community, because we know it takes a village, and then ultimately the culture. So I'm going to kick it right off, and I'm actually going to uh, ask the first question to Corey, because Corey let me know this really early. He got a bunch of siblings. He's got like old school black family style, 13 kids running through the house. So Corey... How do you keep all those people in tune with the latest and greatest technology? Yeah, it's a good question. I uh, I spend more time listening than, than sort of telling, right? So uh, I got some family members who are younger than me who will come up and be like, yo, Unc, should we do this thing? Or, hey, Unc, have you heard of this thing? Uh, I got older family members who are like, man, I'm not messing with the iPhone. What is this crazy new technology foolishness you're still using? And they're talking about an iPhone, right? So <laughs> the cool thing about, you know, being in tech is uh, as soon as you join the family, everyone sort of says, hey, I got this problem or I got this thing. And so you become all things tech, even if you have no expertise in that area. But what is fun about that is it helps me to also continue to use small moments to educate folks. So um, my sister's always asking questions and I'm like, yeah, well, didn't you consider this? And then next thing you know, she's like, see, I learned. And then that's an hour into our conversation because that's how it goes when you got siblings. Um, but yeah, that's that's my take on it. I'm curious to hear from others. <laughs> Anybody got a, a thought on that? I know for me, I, I was a veteran, so I often had people asking me about the military stuff, and I was like, don't do it. Stay in school. Get you a tech background. If you don't want to stay in school, get you a tech background anyway. It doesn't really matter what you're trying to do as long as it's not going to get you in jail somewhere but it's also going to keep you moving. But, but that is 
kind of like the hard part, right? Which is like, there's so much that they have no context of. There's only what they see on the outside. And, and part of what, like, what we do is end up bucking the trend, which is hard when you're at work and you're one of the onlys, which I often talk about, but won't talk about here. Um, and then there's the opposite side of when you're one of the onlys inside of your family and, and your family has no context of like what it means to get paid with stock or why it is that you want to take a job that doesn't have a pension. Right. Um, and so that long term career, that that longevity is something that is something that you don't see in the beginning. You just see an opportunity to go do something that you love and possibly make some money. And you're like, hey, let's go do it. I'm like, hey, just lean into it and buck the trend because we black. We've been doing that all of our lives anyway. <laughs> yeah. Anyone else? Yeah. Um, and Chande, I am the oldest of four siblings and I have a, a son and I wanted to speak probably more from the parenthood perspective of family. Um, he, so I'm a career switcher. I switched from sales into engineering um, like two and a half years ago. So it hasn't been that long, but um, he not only was my son was a big inspiration in me switching, but I also wanted to open up this field for him that to me seemed like I had these cer certain ser stereotypes in my head when I started to teach myself to code. And I thought engineers were just these like antisocial, weird creatures who just like had these bottle cap glasses and drink diet Coke and sat in dark rooms and plugging away at like zeros and ones all day. And I was like, that's not me. So that's absolutely not a field that I want to be a part of. And um, as I've built more of a community around myself um, and I try to do the same for my son, I've realized that tech comes in so many different flavors, not just from position perspective, but like people just bring their creativity, their full selves to, to work. And there's so much great diversity in the types of personalities that you see. And so I try to expose my son to a lot of that um i'll bring him i'll tell he'll come along with me to a conference uh mic checks and things and get introduced to people he'll come with me to um different meetings that i have i'm part of this group called dev color which is a group outside of work but it's dedicated to the professional development of black folk pretty much um in the tech space so i'll bring him to those meetings and he gets to meet people I also, when I was learning to code, would build projects that had him in mind. So, hey, I'm trying to teach him his letters or, hey, I'm trying to teach him how to read. So I'll spin up a, a little project for him. And I also get him involved in the code. And so he he can't do the things that I can do. But um, as he's learning to read, he's learning about variables and different aspects of JavaScript. And um I'm trying to make it look cool for him. And I know I'm not always gonna be cool. He's five years old now. I'm not always gonna be cool to him, but hopefully um, by exposing him to different people from different backgrounds, he'll see something that will either help his decision to move into tech or his decision to stay away from tech. I'm going to use that to pivot into the next question, because I'm, I'm glad that you were talking about younger family members, including, you know, your children, um, also younger siblings, if you have them. Um, obviously, right now, like. I I grew up in a realm where like Facebook was like the, the biggest level of technology that existed. And now, like. I see you, my sister who just graduated high school, I see what their generation is doing, and I'm just like, wow, there's so many wonderful opportunities. I do hackathons and like someone was talking about using like computer vision to help solve food desert problems and things like this. And I'm like, yo, these kids are smart and they're excited and they got the technology there with them. Um, I'm, I'm gonna kick this over to Cecil. Cecil, how do you encourage your younger family members to, to get involved as well? Yeah, um, I almost don't have to, which which kind of sounds like a cop out answer, but you know, when I, so I have a 10 year old, right? And when I, when I think about my son, like he's growing up in the age of technology, right? So there's certain things for him that are just natural, that are not, that weren't for me. Um, and so for him, technology is just kind of like a part of his everyday. Um, and I think that's an important thing to recognize because I'll give you an example, right? Like, so I like to tell this story of, you know, we used to have the Xbox Connect thing, right? And it was on top of the TV. And when, um, 
when I have the Xbox thing on the top, right? Like my, my dad would call on Skype, right? We had Skype on the TV. And my son thought my dad lived on TV, right? And so he would use, he would like walk around the TV and he'd be like, you know, his granddad, like his granddad, like living in the TV. You know what I mean? Um, so now as I'm thinking about what it was like for me, like I had to call my grandparents on the phone. I used to drive to, drive to their house or whatever. Like that's how I interacted with them. But seeing that for me just made me realize like how different technology is for them. Like for them, it's just like a part of their day to day. It's just a part of their world. And I guess kind of like piggybacking off of what Sean Day was talking about, you know, I try to do things like, like when he's doing his homework, you know what I mean? Like he's doing math, right? And I might, I don't know, spin up little Python REPL and I'm like, okay, well, hey, type like two plus two or type two times two, right? Like, like see if the computer could help you with your homework, right? Like see if we could do some of these types of things together, right? And see what it looks like. So I kind of just get him used to like diving a little bit deeper into like what technology can do, you know what I mean? Like, you know, he has phones and tablets and all this other types of stuff around him, like game consoles and stuff like that. And I try to just go like a level deeper, right? Like, oh, well, what do you think needs to happen for this thing to work, right? Like, how do you think the art was made? And how do you think the music was made? And how do you think, you know, the thing is moving, right? Like, how do you think when you click the button, it does stuff, right? And like, we just try to like, kind of get him into like that mind of thinking. Because I guess, I guess the fact of the matter is like, Technology is kind of just in everything, right? And when I think about education specifically, you think about like English and math, right? Like it's just a thing we all do from K to college, right? You know, I feel like technology is very much the same way, right? Like they're growing up with it. And so it's kind of just in us to, to make sure like they understand what's happening, right? And I also understand like, hey, well, I want to build a company. I want to make video games, right? I want to own a store whatever the case right like how can technology kind of help me do the things and we just got to get them used to doing the thing right so now it just kind of becomes what they do it's funny because i also this is paris by the way <laughs> i also have a 10 year old son he loves video games he loves drawing the characters like literally on paper but then he also loves drawing them on his ipad and he has a laptop where he actually plays the games um and I would sort of ask questions around, like, I just want to see what his curiosity was. So I'm like, you know, oh, I see that you love drawing. Like, what if you kind of like created a game, you know, like just trying to get him to understand like how games are made and the different aspects that go into it. He's like, he's like, um, I want to make games, but I don't want to code. Like code, coding is boring. And I'm like, well, you could, you could design a game um, instead if you don't want to code it, but in order for it to be functional, you're going to have to learn to code. He's, and then he's like, oh, okay, so if I want to make my own game and it can work and people can actually play it, I have to learn to code. I'm like, yes. And I'm like, and that can be fun because this is something you actually enjoy. You know, like sometimes we'll get jobs where we're coding, but it's not something we're super passionate about. Um, but when you are passionate about it, like when you have your little side projects, like you love to code, you're enjoying it at that point because it's something you're passionate about and you truly enjoy. And I'm trying to get my son to understand that. Um, and so I'm doing that through video games. And even if it's not, you know, if it's not coding, it could be design or maybe like animation. I don't know, but something around technology. And I don't think he even has a choice because, um, you know, like they were saying, code co or not coding, technology is everywhere. There's kind of no way to avoid getting into it somehow. And I'll say this is April. On the flip side for me, um, prior to working on the book that I did, a lot of my work in the tech space was with a much more older generation. And that's how I got my start in tech, which was teaching folks who were old enough to be my parents how to use the technology we had at work. But what I've learned over time as well, aside from that, is for those of us who are, are in tech, we sometimes tend to think that everyone already knows what's out there, what technology is new, but it's also the case that it's not always what's happening. So take my partner, for example, he works in the medical field. So, so far removed from what I do in tech. And I thought he understood what chat GPT was and he had no clue what it was whatsoever. And I introduced him to the concept of it. And I'm just like, you know, you can like use this at work to generate things that you need, whether it be the draft or like contracts and stuff like that. So we tried it out. He was amazed because I was just like, this thing that would have taken you hours to do, we just spit it out in like two minutes, me writing the prompt, 
tweaking whatever the output was. So he was amazed after that. And then I didn't realize how much he would get hooked onto it until one day I was at dinner and he reached out and he was like, hey, can we add another paragraph to this thing? And I'm just like, yeah. He was like, well, you can do it when you get home. And I'm like, I have access to it on my phone. You know that, right? He was like, what? And I'm like, yeah, it's also available like for me to get to on my phone. So I share that to say for those who aren't in tech and those who are so older generation, just keeping in mind that they don't know everything that we know that's happening in this space. And I think it's really important to expose them to that. And that's what led me to working within advocacy as well, because yes, there's certain technology I'm responsible for sharing with the community and the world, but also just realizing that this is something I really love to do, just that exposure and bring that awareness to people. And even if it doesn't lead into a career path for someone, more so just showing how they could leverage the technology um, as well in their day to day, but also showing that they can also use it. They don't have to be a genius to know how to do X, Y, Z all the time. So that's what I've been doing, I would say, in my own personal life. And also, I'm just amazed that my grandma knows how to use gifts. She just started sending them to me one day. And I'm like, how would you even get to the, the part on your phone to send gifts, for example? So now, as I'm thinking through how I interact with her and her using her cell phone, she had made the comment the other day that she wished she knew how to take pictures. So now I'm trying to think, how do I explain to someone that's in their late 70s, for example, how to take pictures on their phone and send them as well? So for me, it's a different way of communicating how technology works, especially for a generation. Take my grandma, for example, who just didn't grow up with cell phones, who didn't grow up using computers as well. So it's an interesting place to be, but... I love it because the more of us who understand how to use technology, especially um, as a people, the better. So that way we're not we're not far behind or behind at all. That that also saves you the the energy of like, all right, hey, look, this is how we use just to, you know, yeah. not let's let's not send it after every message, just only when you yeah. really want to emphasize them points. But yeah. but I love that you know it's it's not just the immediate family, and when we think about the older generation, in many ways, we think about the people that helped raise us, you know, not just your mom and them, but also like the entire block, the entire community. Um, I have a question, and this is gonna be for, for Shande. Did, did your upbringing from family and the surrounding community push you in any direction uh, towards or away from tech initially? Yeah, actually, so my, my dad was, like he, you know, I was a little daddy's girl and he, but he, he's an engineer, but um, he calls himself a, a hammer and nail or something engineer, but he does like mechanical engineering and he's always like done work with con contractors, constructors and things like that. And um, he was very tech savvy or is still very tech savvy and um, noticed that I took a lot of interest in the C DOS programming, which was popular when I was a kid, I'm probably dating myself, but um, using the little C prompts and stuff and like spinning up Oregon Trail. And um, I wanted to design games and things like that. And so he pushed me, he nudged me to get into engineering or get into some type of programming. And because he pushed me to, to get into it, I thought instantly that it wasn't cool and I just didn't want to do it. So my stereotypes that I talked about where I think of engineers as these dorks who just like sit in the room drinking Diet Coke. My dad, he is a dork, but he's not like, he doesn't like Diet Coke, but he's a dork in so many other ways. And I was like, I don't want to be that. So I stayed away from tech and I ended up going into sales or I went into business. Um, so my degrees are in business and I ended up in sales through that path. And through that career, I developed a lot of soft skills. And then um, I like throughout different points in my career, I could see little things that were triggering me to explore more of engineering. For example, one of my sales jobs, I was selling software to engineers and um, it's a software for uh, mathematical programming called MATLAB and a system for a simulation called Simulink. And my customer was NASA. And so I'm selling to actual rocket scientists. And this is, again, reaffirming for me that everybody's pretty much a dork um, in this world. 
but um, the stuff that they were doing was so cool. I think what would have been nice for me in terms of community was to be exposed to more people who were outside of my family. It was just me being a rebellious, everything, preteen, teen, 20 year old, 30 something year old now, um, that kind of pushed me away from like, oh, I don't wanna do what my dad does or anything that's related to something that my dad thinks is cool because that automatically qualifies it as not cool. But um, I think what would have helped me in terms of community is to see more people who I thought were cool or who I thought could be mentors um, that I could look up to who actually were serving in these roles. Like I saw a lot of cool black women in nursing roles, or I saw like cool black men you know, trying to get their first record deal and things like that. But um, if I had been exposed to cool people just doing their own thing, they don't have to, you know, wear any certain type of clothes or anything like that, but just doing their own thing, who also worked in tech, I think that probably would have made me move into tech a lot sooner. Yeah, I feel like I have a very, like, so my dad indirectly got me into tech without knowing it to be honest with you. So, so, my, so my dad was in the medical field or is in the medical field. And, you know, growing up, growing up in the Caribbean, I grew up in Antigua, we never had like computers in the classroom. We never had, like computing wasn't like a thing, right? And my dad got a computer. Um, I remember it was a Comprac Pissario, if you all remember what, what those used to look like. And he brought it home so he could write reports, right? And so for me, being the little kid in the house, I'm like, oh, this is this new thing that's in the house and I have to, I got to play with it, right? And so, of course, it was like the new tool that was in the house. And, you know, like as a kid, you're not supposed to touch, you know, your parents things. And so, you know, when they went to bed, I turn it on. Right? And I, I mess with it and I play with it and I just got so ingrained in it. And it, it's funny because like over time, I became better than he was like at the machine. Right. And, I, and he was just like, how do you know how to do all this stuff on the machine? Like, I told you not to touch my stuff. Right. Like, and that's that's really what was happening there. Um, and then over time, like the longer we had it, like we, you know, we'd have folks come over and fix the printer and, you know, fix the internet and do to do all this types of stuff. And so I would always just sit down and watch them because I was just so fascinated about like, what did they do to get the thing to work, right? Like, how did you, you know, move the button, plug in the wire, whatever cases, right? And so around me, the type of people that were in computing, um, for me at the time, were just people that fixed printers and plugged in cables, right? Like that was the thing that I understood and I knew. And so that's what I wanted to do, right? Like that, that was my influence to be like, okay, well, I want to be a computer person. And being a computer person meant that I fixed printers and I plugged in network cables, right? And, and that was cool. But then it was only until I got to college where, you know, I think going to college for me was like, okay, you've left the country and you're now in a different space. And so now I got a different level of perspective, right? And the perspective was, oh, well, you don't just have to do this. Right? Like you don't just have to plug in cables and fix printers, but you could, I don't know, you could work at tech companies, you can write code, you can build games, you can do all of this other types of stuff. And so I think the spark was was lit, right? Like the match was lit, the spark kind of went off when my dad brought home this machine to like write reports. And then I kind of just went down this rabbit hole um, of like, oh, okay, well, what else can I do, right? And then it kind of just went on from there. My story is like a little different because it actually getting into tech came from people outside of my family. My dad like owned a trash company and my mom was a DEI professional in education. So we weren't tech people at all. Um, but I, I used to be like a wax specialist at European Wax Center. So I waxed body hair full time. And I had this client who came in every month who was a software engineer for Rent the Runway. Um, and she kept telling me, like, you should get into tech. We should learn to code, become a software engineer. You're, you're going to make great money. Um, and I, for me, I'm like, I am not smart enough to become a software engineer. Like, I'm horrible at math. I failed math every year of my life. I can't do it. So I always ignored her. But then I learned that my brother, my little brother, who was, I don't know, 12 at the time, it was part of his, his curriculum in school um, to learn to code. And I asked his principal, I'm like, why are kids his age learning to code? Like, I feel like that's what college kids are doing. And he explained to me, like, you know, if you don't gain some sort of technological background, you're going to be left behind. Like, this is the direction that the world is going in. And I thought about how I was being impacted by technology. 
Um, not that wax specialists no longer exist, but I was losing clients to laser hair removal, right? And when you get laser hair removal, it's permanent and people don't have to get wax anymore. So I was like, oh, wow, like I'm actually being impacted. Maybe I should learn something about this industry. And I chose coding because that's the only thing I knew existed. Um, and yeah, and that's how I, I got in. It was people outside of uh, my family. And I will say for me coming into tech was nothing that was a lifelong plan whatsoever. I was freshly divorced, needed money. And at the time I was working in luxury fashion and having worked in the retail side, there's not a lot of money in that space. I was accustomed to a certain life growing up and I did not have the privilege of my parents continuing to pay for all the things that I wanted as I became an adult. And so I knew that I had to take those matters into my own hand, get myself back up on my feet after divorce as well. And lo and behold, tech was the industry that had a good source of income. And that's what I went for. Having now joined the industry now, I guess, 10 years ago, I want to say, um, I'm definitely happy to be here for sure. And I've definitely found various passions in this space. I started as a, um, as a project manager, I've been a program manager, and then eventually switching into just programming itself. So I would say for me, just given life circumstances, especially financial circumstances, that's really what drove me here to this space. And fortunately, I've had a lot of people that I've met throughout my time, um, even folks that are here on this panel as well, that I'm really good friends with that have been there uh, to help in any moments where I've had questions or to learn more about uh, different roles that are available. And I'm looking through the chat and there was mention about just DevRel and advocacy being a job. Like before I got into advocacy, I was doing this just for fun on my own outside of one of my like other jobs until I realized that you can actually get paid for advocating about tech. And once I learned that, that's how I came over into advocacy and I've been here ever since and I really do like it. But it just goes to show you that for me, my motivator was trying to make the best out of a bad situation and I'm, I'm glad that I did it. I can definitely say that. I don't regret it. I uh, love fashion still, don't get me wrong, but I would say coming into tech, it's definitely have changed my personal life for the better. You know, I I, I also have to, to be transparent that when I got the role that I'm in now with Microsoft, I did it for two reasons. One of those being the bag. Um, but the other one was particularly um, seeing folks like Corey, who is previously at Microsoft, Cecil, who's previously at Microsoft, April, who is one of my colleagues, which is like, like what black, I can work with black women. This is, this is a thing. Like I was excited. I was absolutely pumped to see that. And I shouldn't even say my colleague, my superior. So not only am I working in a space where it's like, wow, there are people who are like me. There are people who are like my daughter that are in just my role but they're above and there's, there's room for elevation there. Um, but I would also be lying if I didn't say, nah, the bag was good too. Um, so that being said, when you do accept that, that role, when you take that job, there, there can be some stigma to it. There can be some, Oh, now you work for the man. Now you work, you know, you work for this company, you work for that white dude up in the, you know, the ivory tower that nobody knows their name. Um, do you think about these things and maybe how your decision to join a company or your decision to advocate for a certain technology has an impact on both you in terms of your community or just your community in general? And I'm, I'm going to kick this off to April. Yeah, I can say that when you're in a position at a company that's very much clearly not predominantly of color and you're in a role especially with me not even just being in management even before i was in management it's almost as though there's an additional part of your job description that no one talks about and that's being sure that you are taking care of your people because you are oftentimes that only person in the room who looks like you or who even has a background that you have that's going to be very important for the conversations that are being held, especially as we talk about products that are coming to market, products that are being improved, so on and so forth. And so what I've learned in my time is that 
I have this additional responsibility that I personally honestly love because I feel that it's not to say no one else in the room would speak up for other Black people if I wasn't there. However, I will say that because I am there, it does feel like I'm responsible to make sure that I bring our experiences and our feedback to the table, but also that I'm also ensuring that we are also being exposed to the technologies that we have. And so last year, perfect example, I spent some time with some, some other individuals uh, within the company who were interested in bringing extended reality technology to HBCUs. And not just the main ones that most people happen to hear about, but there's like, what is it, 98 or 102 HBCUs in this country. But typically folks hear about the same like 10 or so. So we really wanted to tackle those ones outside of that 10 and make sure that we were going around and we were doing workshops, things of that nature. And it turned out pretty well. Um, like with everywhere in the industry right now, everyone was impacted by economy. So we've had to slow down our efforts. But during that time, being able to go to speak with other students um, who were in college who was just like shocked that we had a presence there to come and talk about this technology and just a lot of the thank yous and the hearing a lot of like no one has ever come to talk to us about you know xyz before it just shows you there's a really big gap in where we're making connections but it also shows that like if someone like myself was not there in a room to bring this idea to the forefront it would have been just a huge missed opportunity and so I'm always a fan of if you have the space um, and the room and a seat at the table to actually share these ideas and to also put together groups of folks to go and do these things, that's great. Definitely take that opportunity. And even now that my role has changed a bit with my um, with my employer, I still try to find those ways where I can make sure that our community is being thought of. And especially now with me working um, still in the XR space, there's different things around like avatars and metaverse and then some of the stuff over in like the gaming side, for example. And anytime there's a chance for me to just like plug the communities that I've gotten to to know, different organizations that I've gotten to know to make sure that um, Black and African-American people are thought of, I make those connections. And it's like, for me, like I said, it's that hidden part of your job description that no one talks about, but you do become responsible for that because often I think like Corey or Cecil might have said, I think it was Corey, you're really usually the only person in the room. Um, when when you have these conversations, especially in big tech. So I love it. I continue to do it. And that's why I decided to also be in advocacy as well. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll hop in on this as well, because this is something that um, like I think we all are hitting on some undertones that are, are not exactly being called out. So I'm going to call one of them out, which is um, when you are Black in tech, the chances of you being one of the onlys is probably higher than you would think about when you come into the industry. And then as you move further up the uh, the corporate ladder or the management ladder, those chances increase even much more significantly, which I think is crazy. But um, I learned something from uh, one of my good friends and one of my mentors, uh, LaFawn Davis over at Indeed, where she was like, she, she said, look, just be intentional. And I said, what do you mean just be intentional? Like, what do you mean? <laughs> she goes, look, instead of us bearing the cost of what it means to have to continue to bring folks with us or to represent that voice, like super intentionally write down that this is your plan and then go ask for the resources to deliver the things. And so like, I'm fortunate that in my role right now, I get to hire people because I'm super intentional about ensuring that the candidates that we consider don't look all the same. And in so doing, it forces me to also then like confront some of what I would call my own uh, vulnerabilities, shortcomings, where I may not even know how to get the support that I need from my peers to be able to fulfill some of this. Let's go grow that muscle. And then it makes me a better leader. And so one of the things that I would just add to this is like, you know, you get better at this, the more you lean into it, lean into it even more so that you can find the support you need to succeed at it. I love that. Did anyone else want to jump in on that or? No? Okay. 
I, I agree with, with everything that was said. Um, and I will also say Corey, Corey has sat there and heard me be very intentional about like, this is what I'm doing. This is why I'm doing it. And this is what I hope happens, you know, three years from now because of that decision that was made. Um, speaking of decisions being made, um, one of the biggest decisions that pops up is getting hired, finding that job, getting placed. Uh, who am I going to work with? How do I know this company cares about me? Um, I'm glad that we got, like, in my opinion, one of the most qualified people to talk about this in, in Paris on here. So I'm, I'm just going to ask Paris straight up, like, what does the tech story look like for Black people in hiring right now? Okay, so I'm going to I'm gonna say this. Um, so Black Tech Pipeline, right? We have a job board. I'm just going to talk about the job board specifically. We have a job board where every company on there they have to talk about you know, their company values, their DEI initiatives, practices and policies, how they practice safety and how leadership supports employees. They have to talk about all of that, right? And I, I have companies talk about these things because I want people to get sort of like this transparent view of what it could look like to work there. This is how you're going to be supported. This is how you know they practice safety and, and tend to... Um, you know, community members who look like you, like, that's what I'm providing. However, you don't actually know until you get there. You don't, everyone's experience is always going to be different. Um, and I'm, I'm trying to, <laughs> I'm trying to like provide some, some sort of like, uh, like a trailer almost like a, this is a sneak peek of, you know, this is what they say they're doing. This is what it may uh, be like for you. This is what I'm hoping it's going to be like for you. Um, and then once you get there, you're going to have your own experience and you may not have the same experience as someone else who looks like you that's there. Um, so that's what I'm going to say. As far as companies looking to hire, you know, black tech talent and black professionals, they're absolutely doing it. Um, and when companies come to me specifically, I interview them. I make sure that they're coming to me for non-performative reasons. They're here because they sincerely want to hire and retain um, black tech talent, and they want to see them grow within the company, grow and thrive within their careers. Um, but again, I never like to make promises. This is what they are telling me. This is um, the responses that I've gotten. Um, but you're not going to know until you're in there. But I'm I'm there to support you know any candidates that that come from Black Tech Pipeline. I'm there to support them um, through my feedback model, and that's where I check in with them um bi-weekly to make sure that they're having good experience and if they're not or even if they are i then check in with their manager the employer to be like okay this is where we need to improve their experience and this is what their journey here is going to look like these are their their goals their hopes and dreams and this is how we're going to help them get there um yeah i'm not sure if that answered the question or if you want to dig in deeper i i think it did and uh i i want to maybe kick it to some other people but before I do that, I want to preface with like, I think this is why you need both the official hiring grounds for black talent and the unofficial hiring grounds behind the scenes who are like, yo, you're going to go work for this company. I used to work for them. Who's your manager going to be like, OK, you need to be looking out for this. I know um, we had someone in the chat that created the black DevRel. Uh, Discord community. And I know Corey and I are both, and I think Cecil is in there as well. And, and of course, anybody else that wants to join up, please do. Um, but that's a that's a big thing. You know, you have people that are coming in that are, I would say, almost in a state of vulnerability where they're like, I just want a job. And there's that danger of like, look, if you just want a job, there are plenty of people hiring. But if you want a job that's going to get you out of this industry in the next five years, Go ahead and take those jobs. But you have a bunch of people here that have those experiences that know these people. The back channel in DevRel is massive and it's only getting bigger. You're going to know who, who you want to be working with, not just from a company side, but also from a management side as well. But I don't think that the company themselves are going to ever be able to share that. So you got to have that back channel to do that part. I'll throw one thing out there, which I think is interesting, which is a lot of folks don't realize the power of the Whisper Network. And I, I talk about the Whisper Network all the time because folks don't don't think about this, which is like prior to the Internet, people just talked to each other and they said, 
hey, you probably don't want to be there or you probably do want to be there. And with the power of the internet, that thing has hit a scale in such a way where now we have you know, Discord servers of mostly black professionals who are uh, super active and engaged in all things developer relations. Or you have um, other types of servers where people who find community are looking for uh, the sense of belonging, camaraderie, uh, support, and everything that comes with that. And so what I appreciate now is legitimately, it's so much easier to find the support and at the same time, it's so much harder to find what it is that you're looking for. Why do I say it that way? Because like, you don't know what you don't know. Oftentimes you go on YouTube and folks are like, yeah, you could get a job in tech in three weeks. Watch this. Or you see these things on TikTok where it's like, this is how I do my job on the day to day. And that's not everyone's experience to the point that Paris was making earlier. So I, I really encourage folks to be curious. Be curious about what it is that they're super interested in and why, and then lean into those communities and those networks to find the support that they're looking for. Because odds are, like, somebody will be able to know someone who can help you. Exactly. And and to talk about like the whisper networks. So there are platforms, um, aside from literally knowing people being in discords and stuff, there are platforms like Blind and Inside Voices. Um, where you can talk about your experience at your specific company. You can talk about specific people within the company and people can respond to you to be like, yeah, I had that experience with them as well. Or, oh, this happened. Like, it's very, there's a lot of tea in there. Um, and again, not everyone's experience is going to be your experience, but it's it's good to at least to know, to have a heads up, right? So you can use those platforms as well if you don't. And, and, and they're anonymous as well. So that's also fine. I love it. So I, I want to move to the next question because when we were reading the intros, I was, you know, I was caught by one that that showcased like a bunch of excellence happening. Like these are things happening, writing books, being, you know, being recognized by top universities in the country and doing these things. Uh, yeah, yes, we're talking about April. Um, April, what can we do to ensure that uh, we're not ignored when it comes to the conversation of tech excellence? Because obviously we got excellent people, but hopefully I'm not the only person out here like trying to promote them. What, what can we do to, to amplify that? Yes, I truly believe in the concept of each one teach one, as well as ensuring that when we even hear us here on this panel, um, folks who are super well known in the tech space, people who may just be getting started, that we continue to amplify each other because you never truly know who's listening. You never truly always know who's connected to who either. And I think that's super important. Um, for me, I would say being in this space with the things I've accomplished so far uh, in, in my career, I'm very happy with where I am. And for me, it's not a competition as I look at my other peers and things that they're doing. And because I have that mindset, when I know there's an opportunity that's, that would be great for someone else that I know, I mention them because I also want to see them succeed. And that's also why I got to working in the space that I'm in now, because I want to make sure other people have a really great experience. I want to make sure that people are able to do whatever their heart desires, especially if it's around the tech space. And so I think amplifying those in rooms that they may not be present is super important. Ensuring that in the work environment as well, when there is that moment to provide feedback that's going to impact people who look like us, that we are vocal about that. And I mentioned in the YouTube comments about shaking tables and trust me, I've shaken some tables and I've risked my own like career by saying certain things and having certain conversations with people who are super high up at Microsoft. But I knew at the end of the day that had I not taken that opportunity to do that, it can negatively impact people who are either presently there or coming there in the future. And I felt that making sure that other people had a positive experience 
was um, was possible for them. And does that mean sometimes risking my own career? Sure, it does. It does look like that sometime. But like I said, I'm not in competition with everyone else. I want to see everyone else succeed. And so whatever it takes to make that happen, I'm going to do that for sure. And I always encourage other folks as well. If you have that chance to do that, do it. Make sure that you're amplifying others. Make sure that we're looking out for one another as well. Yeah, I loved the theme of what April just said, the lift as you climb, because um, it can be hard. And I'm originally from Massachusetts. And as you can imagine, there's not diversity there. Like no matter where you are, you're the only one um, where you are. Paris, I think you're in Massachusetts as well. So you probably get it. But um, so there are there are two or more ways that you can kind of grow up as a Black person in Massachusetts. You can be the one who's like the crabs in a barrel. Like, you know, if I made it, I just got to make sure that I'm here and I'm only going to protect myself because I don't know you, these resources are scarce and people could take this away from me at any moment. Or you could be the community type of person who is like, okay, I got here, the door was open for me, or I busted this door open. Who else wants to come in? And let's all let's all get it in. And um, I have actually, um, to be honest, served both roles in different parts of my life and in different areas of life. And I found that the community one, the lift as you climb one has by far been the most effective, um, helping to boost my career and also helping me to sleep at night. And then also helping with other people and making sure that their careers are good. And as I am helping other people, I'm continuing to gain skills as I'm teaching I'm learning as I'm helping other people's careers, I'm boosting my own career. So, um, and it's not always glaringly apparent how much helping other people can help you, but it always comes. Like you serving as the mentor or the one person who reached around to the hiring, I shouldn't say reach around, who went around to talk to the hiring manager and was like, oh, you know, I have this phenomenal person who I think would be a great fit at the company. You having those conversations helps to put you in a position where people want to help you or um, people start to look at you as some like the the connector, the plug, the um, this, just this shining person in the community and the person that can help. And it also feels really good to um, build this community around you and to be helping other people. And at my last company, um, I uh, was part of a team of just a handful of people who started our first ERG. And we tried to identify reasons why this company wasn't hiring um, Black employees at a level that is like, we live, in, we live in Atlanta, so like there should be a lot more Black people at this company. Um, not retaining the amount of employees that you would expect to see in an Atlanta-based company. Um, and how come their experience was so poor? And I learned a lot from having those conversations about um, just the strength that we have as Black people when we come together. We, um, we are alike in skin color and diverse in all other ways. And there's so many different things that we can bring to the table ourselves and, and um, so much not chaos, so much um, great things, so much excellence that we can bring <laughs> to the table <laughs> when we come together with a common mission and looking out for each other at the same time. Something else I'll say, because we've talked about sort of like passing the torch, which is extremely important, um, but I think also bragging, like like if you did something, say that. Like if, if you accomplish something, talk about it. Like really put some respect on your name. Give yourself credit. You are so valuable and amazing. Like talk about it. You accomplished that. Let us know and, and let us celebrate you. There's no, I don't, stop being so humble. I guess that's all I'm going to say about that. I, I love that because yeah, that's, I think that, there is a level of like, you need to not be afraid to shout out the awesome things that you're doing so that everyone else can can amplify it. 
And for those people that are maybe a little quiet, I, I'll leave this open for anybody to answer. You know, we got plenty of introverts out there that are doing amazing things. There's some folks who are doing amazing things and not getting paid for it. Therefore, they don't feel validated that what they're doing is actually that great. How do you how do you reach out to, you know, little bro, little sis, little them and be like, hey, I see what you're doing and it's dope. Like, how do you how do we how do we put this in front of more people? How do we put this on a portfolio? How do we get this on a website? What are some techniques that y'all have seen that that work? Um, I think for me, because I've seen a lot of folks like come and go. And one of the things that is always in them is like, oh, I never felt the value. You know what I mean? Like I never felt the value in the thing that I did. I never felt value in the work that I was doing. So I left. I went and I did something else. And so one of the things that I try to do with with everyone that I work with, whether it's teammates on the same level above or below, it doesn't really matter. Um, just be very intentional and in letting people know how much you appreciate the work that they do. And, and it's simple. It's super simple. It's just like, you know, Corey, me and you did a thing. Like, I appreciate you. Thank you so much. Hey, Paris, me and you did a thing, whatever. Thank you. I appreciate it. Simple. You know what I mean? And, and sometimes like all people really want is a thank you. And a thank you could go so far into like, the motivation to changing their day to change like their whole mood because when people don't feel appreciated and then they lose motivation and they just don't have that energy you know what i mean and then you know it's it's hard for them psychologically to kind of like get in the place they need to be to move on and so like we just you know we just need to hold on to each other right and like simple little things like thank you i appreciate your work like that was really helpful go to their manager or their boss or whoever right like Go to their go to their family and be like, yo, your boy helped me out, man. Like this person really helped me out. This is really helpful for me. You know what I mean? Like those little things for me, like go a really far away. Yeah, I was gonna jump in and also just double down on the reciprocated, right? So um something that I I I learned this by accident. Um I'm connected to a number of folks. One of them is a fantastic uh, person by the name of Will Johnson, who also happens to work with me at, at Okta. And Will always tells the story about how I helped him uh, get into the industry and, and recognize his value. And I always say back to him, like, hey, Will, man, like, you know, I didn't know I had that impact. So I need you to know that, like, I appreciate you. Because oftentimes, like, I, I talk to a lot of different people in the industry. I think we all do. And we all do small things, not for clout, not because we're like, oh, my God, like I need you to go shout me out on Twitter just because it's the right thing to do. And so when people come back and say thank you, I often return that back to them and say thank you, um, because it really does mean something to me to know that they were able to either succeed or take the next step or build a connection or achieve whatever it is they were trying to do in part because of a small thing that I helped connect the dots on. Um, so I'm really big on like making sure we reciprocate. I love it. And folks, we're, we're about to wrap up. We got one last question here. And this one, this one is a personal favorite of mine because it combines two things I love, tech and music. Um, there are so many genres and subgenres, if you will, of technology. We were talking about this earlier, where like folks don't even know what jobs are out there. You know, Paris, you know, Paris's son doesn't want to be a programmer, but could be a great game designer, could be a great like UX and UI designer. Like there's so many opportunities that folks don't know about. And I want I want this for the for the YouTube shorts, for the TikToks. I need the clip that says like what is the role that black people are excelling in right now so that you can get into an industry where you got mentors where you got you know opportunity you've got opportunity for elevation in your role what are these opportunities uh i'm gonna, I'm gonna kick it off with Corey. i'm gonna cheat because <laughs> I, I i know so many folks here and i know the work the line of work that they do is all things developer relations and um i i shout out developer relations because it's one of the most visible roles in the way in which you can see yourself represented in both a role that's incredibly technical and a role that's incredibly um, fulfilling. And now developer relations has a career journey as opposed to before. A lot of folks were skeptical about like, hey, does this person in DevRel really know how to code? Well, 
you see it in the faces represented here where we pop up on stage and we tell technical stories in addition to ones that in, in, intersect with our identity. Um, so I always shout out DevRel and, and I've been in DevRel for a really long time. So I'm gonna just leave it there. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna just because you took what I was gonna say. I was gonna say Devro, but so to me, I think this is just true all around. De people in Devro are the influencers of tech to me because you're traveling for conferences, you're speaking, you're creating content, you're doing technical writing, like you're just doing all of these amazing things that bring flavor to projects and companies that you're working at. That's black people. That's black people, like just naturally. And so, yeah, I'm just piggybacking. So I'm sorry. Does anybody have one that isn't Devro? <laughs> Jay, I have another additional perspective. Um, despite also being in Devro, I do agree with everything Corey and Paris have said. But also, if we look a bit more broadly and it aligns with what Paris was saying, as a people, we tend to move the culture forward. And even if there are spaces in tech where we might not have a really big presence, the reality, as with most things in life, once we're present, it's all of a sudden like the thing. It's big because we do come in, we do add in that flavor that Paris is speaking about as well. And it's, we tend to dominate once we're there. So if you are interested in a space in tech and maybe there's not a lot of black people, honestly, I'd say probably look into those roles too, because that gives you the opportunity to start building community in those spaces. It really truly takes seeing someone that looks like you or resonates well with you to get more people involved. And I know that was mentioned um, in an earlier question, but that is the case. I've always been that person who has pursued activities where there's not a lot of Black people in hopes of, one, because I thought it was cool, but then, two, also knowing that it is going to help inspire others to hopefully get involved who look like me. So even if there is a space in tech that you're interested in and none of us happen to really spoke about it during this fireside chat, it doesn't mean not to pursue it. If anything, I would say go pursue it, go make your mark, and then go bring more of us into that space in that space and grow it as well, because it's very much possible to do that. And so I support looking in any direction in tech and just go and dominate. So that's my two cents. I would say yes, snap, snap, snap to everything that everybody said. But um, I have to advocate because I'm not Deverell. I just I talk and <laughs> that's a, that's just the thing that I do. But um, I like to talk. So I do conference talks and things like that. But I'm a, just a straight up engineer. So I feel like I have to advocate for us. There is, um, as April said, whenever you put a black person somewhere, it just adds that seasoning that um, that needs, it just feels like it, it needs to be there. So um, I'll tell you what I feel like I contribute to my team and maybe they could say other things, but um, what I contribute is the, the fun, the, the, the flavor when, you know, we're having meetings and we're demoing the tools that we have built. Um, I'm, I'm doing it in my own way. I'm doing it there's, I'm, I'm bringing my full self to work and I'm going to explain the story. I'm not really code switching either. I'm just explaining the story in, in the way that I think is the most appropriate. Um, and I'm making things fun. And I noticed that when I look at the audience in my presentations at Netflix, um, internal and our customer, I, I work on a team that's we serve our internal, we serve internal customers. So my customer is a Netflix, other Netflix engineer. So when I'm having meetings with my team or with our customers, the, I, I just see the laughs, the smiles on their faces versus when some of my other colleagues who don't necessarily have the same seasoning, um, when, when they're doing their presentations, it's very, very, uh, professional in the traditional sense. And um, mine is professional, but in a season sense. And so um, I, again, anywhere and any presentations that I've seen, we have like a great presence of black people here at Netflix, especially in leadership, um, which was really surprising to me um, coming in. And um, I would say that I've seen the same the same situation happen in any of their presentations or in any of the work that they've done. It just adds that 
you know what I'm saying? Without saying it, it's it's just that that thing that we always do whenever we we come into a space, we bring that thing, and that's what you're gonna bring, no matter where you are in tech. Oh man, I I, I want to wrap it up on that because that's that is that's just facts. That's it. It doesn't matter what the industry is. If you want to get into it, get into it because you're going you're going to add that seasoning. You're going to add that spice, that flavor to it that, that's really going to make you stand out. And then we're all going to help that. We're going to elevate that flavoring even more and, and spread it across the globe. I love it. All right, folks, we have been here for over an hour. I would love to do this again as soon as possible, but I want to be respectful of people's times. I also want to let people get their shout outs. So I'm going to thank each and every one of y'all for, for being on this. This was so long in the making, but also so much stuff was happening behind the scenes that just made it even harder to do. Um, I'm going to just go around the board and let's start with Corey. Corey, thank you so much. Let everybody know where they can find more about the stuff that you're doing. All, all things Corey L. Weathers. You can find me as Corey L. Weathers everywhere. Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn. Uh, we're always doing things. I'm, I'm always just doing the best that I can to both represent my team and uh, bump up stuff that I happen to be doing. So if you see me talking about stuff out in London next week because I'm giving a talk, don't be surprised. The flex. Just the, oh, don't, again, don't don't mind me. I'll be in London. Um, April, thank you so much for joining uh, where can people find out more about what you're doing? Sorry, I'm just dying at Corey. <laughs> um, you can find me on Twitter or Blue Sky or Instagram at Month After Mars, which is April in French, if you're wondering where that came from. And LinkedIn, April Spate as well. I am starting to work on um, a small video game that I'm creating. So I'll be posting about that a bit more, especially as I dive more into 3D modeling, but also just all around game design, because why not? This sounds like a fun project. So follow me on either of those platforms with Month After Mars. And yeah, that's it. Paris, this has been a great first conversation I've gotten to have with you. I can't wait for the next one. Where can people find out more about what you're doing? Yeah, so you can find me at Paris Athena with two S's on Twitter and Instagram, Paris Chandler on LinkedIn, um, at BT Pipeline on Twitter. Sorry, I'm like giving everybody everything. Black Do Tech it. Pipeline on LinkedIn. You can go to blacktechpipeline.com to go to our job board. Um, we're launching a, an AI-powered uh, recruitment platform in a couple of months. So look out for that. Just sign up to our newsletter, which you can find on our website. And yeah, let me get you, let me get you your dream job. <laughs> Sade, thank you so much for joining us as well. Where can people hear more about what you're up to? I have a very Googleable name. So um, anywhere you want to find me, just like look Shande, my Twitter at Shande, Blue Sky at Shande. I don't really use it as much. Um, LinkedIn, Shande. I think I'm probably one of two Shandes there, but the only Shande person in the world. So um, pretty easy to find. And then um, I'm working on a course on TypeScript along with the skills recordings slash badass slash egghead community. Um, so it's called TypeScript for JavaScript for developers. It's meant to um, help folks who come from a JavaScript background and have issues with TypeScript as we all do, um, but mainly for TypeScript for enterprise organizations. So if you're looking to work for a big company and um, convert your existing code base to TypeScript, that's how you'll learn it. So go to ts4js.com. That's T-S-F-O-R-J-S.com. And that's me. And last but not least, Cecil, thank you so much for uh, for joining. Where can people find out more about what you're doing? Sure. Um, I'm at Cecil Phillip on everything. LinkedIn, YouTube, Blue Sky, Hackerderm, Carrier Pigeon, whatever you want to use, I'm on it. <laughs> um, always happy to just connect with people about, you know, whatever it is they're talking about. Um, I, you know, I have, a, I have a big heart for Caribbean people. So if anyone's watching and, you know, Caribbean person in tech and they, you need someone to talk to and, and bounce ideas off of, definitely feel free to reach out. Um, I do a lot of streaming on the Stripe YouTube channel, as you can imagine. Um, so if you're into learning about payments and stuff like that, definitely come over and, and check us out at the Stripe Developers channel. 
Um, I'm recording a course right now for Visual Studio Code for Python developers. So, so that should be out in a couple of months over on the Talk Python um, learning portal. Um, what else is going on? Uh, yeah, I think that's really about it. That's all we got going on right now. So yeah, I mean, glad to be here. Definitely appreciate being here with all of these amazing folks. This was great. And uh, yeah, Jay, whenever you want to do it again, man, just, just let us know. Uh, I'll definitely do that. And if you want to follow me, congratulations. You're already in the spot if you're watching this. So just keep watching these spaces and you'll uh, you'll see more of what I'm doing, whether it's around Python development, um, being, you know, black in tech, uh, tech automation. Uh, eventually, I'm going to start doing more stuff, more live streams and stuff. So um, we, we always say that. And then some other stuff comes up. I also got some podcasts that I do. I do uh, Python Community News which is all things Python that doesn't involve the words pip install. And then I also do Conduit, which is the podcast for productivity for people who hate podcasts that talk about productivity. Um, and that's on Relay FM slash Conduit. Go check that out. New episode is dropping today, actually, for that. So um, everybody, thank you so much. Y'all have been absolutely amazing again. I got plans. This is this is an independent fireside chat. I'm hoping that we can do more independent fireside chats. Uh, people watching, if you know of someone that you would like to see in these conversations, shout them out. Reach it. Get them to reach out to me, and we'll we'll hook it up and make it happen. But that's gonna do it for this one. I want to thank once again all of my wonderful guests, and until next time, y'all be good. <laughs>